time we talked about springs, and I did a little demo with just the one spring and the force versus how much displacement the spring had. Today, we now use the springs in the context of a simple harmonic oscillator. So this is using material from these sections, 16.2, 16.6 from your textbook. And what I have, again, is my spring, of course. And the question is, first of all, how does the mass at the end of the spring move? What kind of motion would we ascribe to a mass placed at the end of a spring? And basically what this entails, bring up the sensor, put the weight on the end of it. Steady. Pulling down and releasing and then letting it bob or whatever on its own. And the type of motion that this thing undergoes is called periodic because it repeats in some period of time. Now we've already encountered some types of periodic motions before which are non-oscillators or which may be in some sense modeled like an oscillator but not a simple harmonic oscillator by any stretch. Uh, which was that we looked at orbits last semester. Now they do share some things in common with the harmonic oscillator. For example, the orbit has an orbital period, as a time it takes to complete an orbit, and that's why we call it a periodic motion. It completes an orbit, completes another orbit, completes another orbit. It does this in some set time. Okay, this thing right here, if we pull it down and release it, will do something similar. It'll bounce up and down in time. And in some amount of time, it'll complete one bounce, same amount of time, next bounce, and so on. So this is a type of periodic motion. It's oscillatory in one dimensional. And what causes it to be an oscillator is this relationship between force and displacement that we saw last time. The force is proportional to the displacement. Now the significance of that, the reason why that's so uh, important, is that basically your force by Newton's second law <coughs> tells you what the acceleration should be. Newton's second law. Okay, so on the one hand you have this, on the other hand you have that the sum of forces on this thing just look like k times x, the displacement. Alright, so if we combine these two equations together, what we end up getting is that m times a, the mass times the acceleration, is equal to negative k times x. Or in other words, kx plus ma is zero. This right here, this is your equation of motion for a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, I'm not going to make you guys solve the equation because it's actually a, it's a differential equation. You may not see that upon a glance but it actually has a hidden differential equation. The reason why is because acceleration is the rate change of the rate change of your position, of your displacement. All right. So this term and this term are somehow related to each other in time, not just as written here. It turns out that the solution to this equation has the form x equals some maximum value of x times the cosine 
of omega times t plus some phase. So that's x as a function of time. And it turns out that we can also get not only the position, but also the velocity and the acceleration. Before we do that, I think it's worth actually doing some sort of demo with this thing and seeing what we can see. There's actually kind of two ways that I can go about this. One is to give you the force versus time graph that I gave you before, but this time with the thing moving up and down. And then we can convert from force to position. How do we get from force to position? Well, the force is k times position. We know the value of k from last time. We had force versus position. I made a plot for you guys. It ended up looking like this somehow. And the main points were that this right here was your initial force turned out to be something like 0.6 newtons, and the slope which is the force constant was given by roughly 15 newtons per meter. All right, so we have these data. I repeated it by the way in the 10 o'clock class, got pretty comparable data in both cases. The intercept rounded to about 0.6 newtons. In both cases, the slope rounded to two significant figures to about 15 newtons per meter. So these seem like reasonable values upon further review. All right. So what I'll do is I'll put on the force versus uh, displacement graph, bearing in mind that I haven't figured out how to zero the thing. Turns itself off. That's off. All right. So let's try that again. Record. All right. See up here. It says zero. sinusoidal looking graph. And if you look at what the mass itself is actually doing, I don't know if everybody can see it because of where I placed it. If I move it out here, I'm going to mess the graph up a little bit. I'll repeat it. There's your nice sinusoidal graph. There's what the mass itself is actually doing. It's just bouncing up and down. And if you look, it's sinusoidal. The amplitude is about the same. The amplitude is how much deflection from your equilibrium point. It's about the same for each bounce. Each bounce takes about the same amount of time. This is periodic motion. This can be described by an equation like this. I said a moment ago that there's actually a second way that we could go about doing this. Now it zooms out, so now it looks weird. You can see that there's some other effects like damping going on. The amplitude actually gets smaller in time, but it takes a while for it to happen. We won't discuss damping today. We won't really discuss it much this semester, other than that I'm pointing out that it does exist. You'll see it some in the lab too, because you'll do something like this in the lab later this semester. Um, but as I was saying, there's a second way that we could do this demo, but it's a little more hard to set up. And the thing is that it may be a little more difficult to change the mass, which is that we could try to hook it up so that the little wheel is actually in contact with something. For that, I would need a ramp. So 
This is apparently a skill that you don't learn. As judged by the questions that I get in physical science all the time, they say, we don't know how to build a ramp. Here's how you build a ramp. We're done. This one I have to do weird because it has that extra hinged board. But in principle, you can just stick the board on a table. And now you have a ramp. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this thing down like this. I'm going to attach the cart to it. switch what I'm recording. The reason why is because if I switch to the wheel and if it works, then what we'll get is to turn itself off. <coughs> but we'll be able to get out of the wheel. It's three graphs. Top one is position, next one is speed, next one is acceleration. Now we can see three graphs together. And let's see if it'll work for me. We record it. Hold this thing as steady as I can. It's pretty damped. about as good as I'm going to get. So what we're going to do is we're going to see about zooming in on this. Hello. So the acceleration one's a little on the rough side. Acceleration one's a little rough, as expected, and you'll see this in the lab too. But what you can hopefully make out here is that you have not one, but three sinusoidal curves. Let's see if it'll let me zoom in one direction, maybe. Yeah, here we go. Don't worry about the shading. We're not interested in that. Just look at the main colored curve. This is sinusoidal. This is sinusoidal. This is sinusoidal. They're a little bit rough as you go down. And the other thing is, if you look closely, you'll notice that the peak of this one matches with the zero point on this one, matches on the absolute trough of this one. And likewise, peak, zero, trough. Okay, what we might say about these curves is that there's some phase offset between them. So in the equation over here, this x equals a cosine omega t plus phi naught. This phi naught term is called phase. In fact, it's your initial phase. What it's there for is because if I try to plot this thing, the <coughs> The case where this is zero just looks like a cosine wave. You know, so it's going to do some guy like this. But you probably noticed that I went, clicked start, then came over here, grabbed this thing, pulled it down, and released it. So there was some time offset between when my oscillations begin and when the timer begins. Now, in principle, I could have somebody over there 
push start at the same time as I give this thing a tap like this. Sets it in oscillation. But because I'm giving it an initial tap, it's not necessarily starting at its maximum displacement. It's starting somewhere like zero displacement, and the tap sets it into oscillation. So I get a different graph that maybe looks more like this. This difference between where the peaks start, this is what that P naught term is telling me. All right, and that P naught term can be positive or it can be negative for what it's worth, depending on if I want to shift it left or right. All right. The amplitude term tells me how big of an oscillation it's making. So the amplitude term would be this guy right here. This is my amplitude. This is the x-axis. This is the time axis. Okay. Now, this one right here was position versus time. You notice, as I said before, that there's some phase shift in the sine waves from position to velocity to acceleration. Right, so, in a sense, you could say each one of these has a different phase term here. It turns out, though, that there's a very specific phase relationship between one and the next and the next. A phase relationship is that it's 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, offset from position to velocity and from velocity to acceleration. So, we could do that by writing a velocity equation that looks like this and then having this term and then a 90 degrees somehow included and then another one that has a 180 degrees included or we could put it in radians and call it pi over 2 and pi. But it turns out that there's a special phase relationship that happens at 90 degrees with sines and cosines, which is that each 90 degrees will split you from a sine to a cosine or to a negative sine or to a negative cosine. So it turns out that my velocity versus time graph, by getting that additional phase, that, that other pi over 2 phase, will now have some maximum speed, and now it's times the sine of omega t plus the same phase term as up here. And it turns out it's negative. Alright. The reasons for why it's negative go back to this differential equation. If we solve the differential equation, we see that yes, in fact, the negative term comes out because in order to get velocity from position, you differentiate. Okay, but we won't worry about that particular detail in this class. Likewise, the acceleration the additional phase means you get a maximum acceleration times cosine omega t plus v naught. Okay, so there exists some maximum acceleration term, there exists some maximum velocity term. We haven't really figured out the values of these two things yet. But it turns out that we could, with a little bit of algebra, figure this one out without any further argument. How do we get this one without any further equations needing to be added and doing a little bit of uh, algebra? Any ideas? By not adding any new equations, all I mean is the equations that we have written on the board are sufficient. We may have to rearrange the equations, but we don't have to come up with any new equations other than rearranging what's already up there. Rearrange displacement. So you want to rearrange this one? How so? 
Okay. So we could try using cosines. What we're going to find is that there's an A max term here, there's an A term here, and somehow the dimensions don't match up. This A term, this amplitude, by the way, sometimes is written as X max. The two are equivalent. So the dimensions are not going to match if we just try to set one of these equal to the other. Because this one has dimensions of length, this one has dimensions of acceleration. In a sense, you are on the right track. We do want to do something with displacement, but it's not with that displacement. It's actually with this equation in here. If I take this equation and I solve it for acceleration, this is saying that A should be negative K over M X. Okay? So in a sense, you're able to rearrange these, but the missing piece is coming out of this equation, this negative K over M term. All right? This is what lets us branch from here to here, bridge from here to here, and keep our dimensions correct. Because now, I can use the fact that x is x max, cosine, blah, blah, blah. It means the maximum value of x is just whatever the amplitude is. The maximum value of a is when x is at its maximum or absolute minimum. If you want to include the minus sign, then it's negative x max. So when x is equal to the amplitude, the acceleration is also equal or has its maximum magnitude. Right, so this is telling us that a max is somehow k over m times x max. And again, I've gotten rid of the minus sign by sort of taking an absolute value. Okay. So this one right here, we could also write as negative k over m, spring constant divided by mass, times the amplitude, same amplitude as we used up here, times the cosine of omega t plus v naught. Okay, so now I've got a solution for what the maximum acceleration should be. So now we come over here and we look. Looks like our maximum displacement it's about 0.075. Our maximum acceleration is saying about 1.7, something like this. So we should be able to compare those two things. Now, we're missing one piece of information. We don't know what the mass of the cart is, but we can very quickly obtain that. Okay, how do we quickly obtain the mass of the cart? Well, there's the built-in force sensor for the cart, so we can flip it upside down. By the way, we had an added mass to it. We can flip this guy upside down. Um, maybe something like this. We put the force sensor on. I better write these numbers down before I do all of this because it's going to get rid of that. 
recording. What we do is we just hold it from the end and see how much force is it saying. So it's saying something like 1.4 to 1.6 newtons. We'll call it 1.5 newtons. So that's 0.15 kilograms. And then I had another 100 on there. Now, the tricky thing in addition is this thing's on a ramp, so there's also an angle at play here. We need to know what the angle is. Unfortunately, I do not have a protractor, but I guess we could call this an exercise in measuring the angle. All right. If we take the uh, x maximum here and we multiply it by k, K was 15 from last time. So we have 15 times 0.075. Oops. We get 1.125. Now we have to divide it by the mass. But it turns out that it's more like dividing by the mass over the uh, cosine of the angle that we're holding it at. Uh, the sine of the angle, excuse me. Right, so the mass just said was about 0.4. So divide by 0.4. That's your 0.15. Sorry, not, not 0.4, 0.25. Divide by 0.25. Okay, and then we need some measure of this angle. I wonder if I do have a protractor. I do not know. All right, no protractor. So we can get an estimate of the angle out of this because one divided by the sine of theta should be this number divided by the other one that we got, the A max divided by K over M X max. sign and we get 22.8 degrees about 20 23 degrees this say that's not terribly far off from what this is if you want to verify it although I will not take further time today to do so other than to make some measurements we can measure the height of this thing so it's 93 centimeters high. We can also measure the ramp base, one meter. It's about 154 meet, uh, centimeters that way. So now you can calculate that angle, see how close does it come to about. There's one other thing that we have to do to really complete this demo. I can put the ramp away now because the rest of it seems to work. But I do need this force sensor. And that thing that we got to do still is that we still need to make a measurement of what happens if we change because I have kept the mass, other than switching between cart and hanging masses, I've kept the mass more or less constant. So if I change the mass, what do we expect to happen 
to the oscillations. Well, we do not necessarily expect it to have any effect on the amplitude because the amplitude is determined when I pull the mass down. It doesn't really matter how much mass I have. That just is how far do I pull it down from the equilibrium point. There is a minor thing that the mass does affect, which is that there is a maximum amount that you can pull it down safely and have it stay on as you'll discover in the lab. And the main reason for that is that if you pull by more than the amount of stretch from equilibrium, stretch from its unstretched length at equilibrium, then it has a tendency of trying to fly off. So here I pull it down. If I pull it down like this, you get this kind of thing. And if it's a light enough mass, it shoots off. All right? So we're going to look now, we're going to do a quick comparison between, this is 200 grams that's been placed on it. I better re-zero it again. Okay, so I'm going to place 200 on it, and then we'll do it again with 400 on it, and we'll see if, how they compare. So here it is at 200, it's recording. Pull down some, and I release. There's my oscillations. Some funny business going on here. It's swinging a little bit. All right. So now I stop. Let's zoom in appropriately. Say from here to here. All right, so here's one of them. This is at 15, about 15.1 seconds. And what we want to do is count some oscillations. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. See where this one is, it says 22.8. All right, so what does that make the period of oscillation? How much time does one oscillation take? Well, I just told you that. The difference between these two timestamps is how much time 10 oscillations take. So we subtract one from the other, 15.1 from 22.8 should be 7.7. The period is how much time does one oscillation take. So if we take this and we divide by the number of oscillations by 10, then we've got the time for one oscillation. Okay, so period T, we use a capital T to represent period, in this case is 0 0.77 seconds. This was with 200 grams. Now let's repeat it. This time we'll put 400 grams on it. 400 grams. Now before I do anything else, I did say today was the first day that we'd have our clickers. So let's do a quick clicker quiz. It'll be a simple one. Um, basically, if I double the amount of mass that's on the end of this, I'll make it even easier. If I increase the amount of mass that's on the end of this, what do you think happens to the period of oscillation? So we'll look at 